And now for something completely machinima. Tracy Harwood. Um, so I've done a little bit of digging around and I've discovered. Ricky Grove. Fog comes in on little cat feet. <laughs> Phil Rice. This is the best film that I've seen all year and maybe ever. Damien Valentine. Use the machinima, Luke. Hello, everyone. This is, and now for something completely machinima, a podcast about machinima and virtual production. I'm here with my pals, Tracy Harwood, Phil Rice, and Damian Valentine. I'm Ricky Grove. And a quick word from our sponsor, WD-40 is probably one of the best. Oh, we're not doing that sponsor thing, are we? Well, we are now. <laughs> oh. oh, let's forget about it. We'll we'll just write it up in a blog post. <laughs> mm-hmm. Anyway, uh, we're here today to talk about some great machinima films and uh, discuss them and think about them. If you have any comments you'd like to make uh, about the show, or if you're the director, contact us at talk at completelymachinima.com. So today, we're going to start out with uh, my my uh, film pick, and I've chosen something that is interesting, and I would like to let you know about how I found it. I end up going to uh, Vimeo, which is a, a great uh, uh, sort of art oriented site as opposed to youtube which is tends to be sort of a free-for-all but a lot of uh, uh of um of machinima made there is done in second life and that's cool you know but it tends to focus on that a lot at least the machinima part of it does and as i came across uh some interesting films one particular director caught my eye and it was Fao Ferdinand. And Fao Ferdinand, uh, I immediately recognized the name as a kind of Second Life handle. So uh, I checked out several of their films, and I found one that I just loved a lot. And it's called Dog Days. It was created fairly recently. And the film, I don't think, is for everyone because it's quite experimental. And I often choose unusual things because I really like the creativity involved in uh, people taking a risk to do something outside of the uh, box of realism and and mainstream storytelling. But what was intriguing to me about this choice was that this artist who calls herself a performance artist, she's in the UK, and she created this short film using text from chat GBT, the poetic text and using video created by artificial intelligence and then composited her own second life uh, character in the mix. I suspect some of it was done in an improvisational manner. Um, But the, the, I don't know of very many machinima people using that combination of things. And I was really impressed with it. Uh, Dog Days is a is a kind of ironic title for it because it's essentially a kind of nonsense film, but with a really serious tone to it. And it has, you're, you're in some sort of strange half-life desolation city, and that's the main background. And there's this character who looks a lot like uh, Billy Holiday or uh, oh, what's that wonderful French singer? But well, anyway, it's a sort of a slight waif like that. And then behind her, there's this boiling, roiling mass of dogs, of collies and German shepherds and dachshunds, and they all they're sort of roiling and constantly changing themselves, which is often the effect you see in a, a AI video. And then she is superimposed herself with a couple other graphics involved in various states of kind of 
despair and fear. And then uh, very slowly, the uh, uh, spoken text comes along, and it's an odd assortment of non sequiturs. And all of the elements combine to create what I felt is an eerie kind of weird feeling of of a kind of lost woman or an oppressed woman who is having memories of her dog and they all sort of meld together it's a short piece and i was really grateful for that because i don't think I have, i've mentioned this before on the show i don't think experimental work especially in machinima can sustain a, a long uh length I think the shorter, the better on those things. But I was very impressed with it. I think Frau Ferdinand, she calls herself a performance artist. And so I did a little work on performance art. And it was really in the 70s that the idea of a, an artist called a performance art um, came about. But it, it's much older than that. It goes all the way back to the turn of the century. Um, and essentially, the... Performance artist is a single person um, who uses um, their body or their presence in a specific medium, and uh, they use time and space in unique ways to express themselves uh, in to to make a point, to a poetic point, a political point, a social point. Um, it's a fascinating medium that has become very popular in uh, Second Life. And she has been doing it quite a bit. Many of her other films on Zoom are quite, or excuse me, on uh, Vimeo are quite unusual and interesting. And I was really taken by this film. And I was curious as to what you guys thought about it. What did you think? You want me to go next? Uh, oh, Phil. Yeah, I'll start. Um, <clears throat> so something that caught my attention with the film was the uh the title uh because i i i like uh oddities of language that appear over the years you know and and you know you'll hear phrases nowadays and wonder where in the world did that come from it's kind of like a little nerdy side hobby of mine and stuff but mm -hmm. uh, dog days uh is uh I can't remember how far back it goes, but the idea of it is, is it was a reference to the hottest days of summer. Um, and the reason that it was called Dog Days is because Sirius, which is the dog star, is most visible during those hot summer months. So uh. that's where the whole idea of Dog Days came. And most people have probably heard Dog Day. Uh, if if they've heard of it at all, they've heard it in the title of that uh, wonderful uh, 1970s film Dog Day Afternoon with Al Pacino and who was the guy that played Fredo in The Godfather? Uh, Frank Cazal, I think it was his name. Um, this this uh, pair of guys who basically it's a it's a bank heist story based on a true story. If I won't go into a whole lot of detail on that here, but it, the story behind that film and why the Godfather actors were in the film. It's like a conspiracy theory type of weird story. <laughs> it's like really bizarre. <clears throat> and it is based on on true events. So uh, wonderful little film. You know, everyone knows Pacino from The Godfather and from, you know, other big hits he was in. This one's maybe lesser known outside of film buffs um, and, and lesser known by younger people nowadays. It's a gem. It's a real interesting film. Great performances, too. Anyway. The film that we're seeing here doesn't seem to have anything to do with that understanding of dog days. It's more of wordplay, uh, you know, Shakespearean style wordplay of, OK, that's an established phrase. And what Shakespeare would do a lot is take a literal phrase and do wordplay to use it non-literally. This is kind of the opposite of that. This is a non-literal phrase that exists in culture. And the artist has taken it for their title in more of a literal interpretation and so hence all the dogs and stuff so right right now that that's a silly thing to obsess on but it's it's a uh, it's it's something that that intrigued me about this that if nothing sure. else i think it made me approach this film with 
okay, so this person is is thinking about these things. This filmmaker thinks about these things. And that to me is a is a nice hook, you know. I always I, I like that. I, I like when I'm encountering someone like that. So uh, when I first watched the film, I did not know how it was made. I recognized the AI generated video part of things, but I did notice that the the foreground character uh, was not AI generated. Um, and I couldn't tell if, uh, I don't know if Damien, if you wondered if it might be iClone, because it kind of, it's something that could have been done with an iClone character, I suppose. Right, right. Um, some of the movements were kind of twitchy in that special second lifey way that yeah. later when I scrolled down the description and saw how it was made and stuff, uh, it didn't surprise me that that was a second life avatar, but the combination works really well together. Um, I know that there's strong feelings out there about, uh, AI generated art, uh, on both sides. Uh, I'm more in the camp of that it's a really interesting development. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not threatened by it, uh, but there are people who are, and maybe rightfully so. I mean, it is something that is a potential game changer, uh, a, a genuine disruptor, I think. Um, but we've, I mentioned in a previous episode of this show that the, the I think my primary interest in AI art is the fact that it's broken, the fact that it's weird. Um, and for me, the naturally the, the the way that I end up making use of that is is mostly uh, comedy purposes. You know, so the whole emphasis on the rendering the wrong number of fingers or the disfigured faces and stuff, right? And that's right. always just been a real attraction to me with it because it it's weird in a way that that you don't often see humans be weird. You know, there's something strange about the algorithm that's playing with our work as its source material that just does weird in a new way. And that's intriguing. And this is, this film showcases, I think the artistic side of that, of that weird, uh, that this film wouldn't, wouldn't be, it wouldn't have caught Ricky or any of our interest if it was just, let's say stock video of dogs and then stock video of a city, a ruined city street. I mean, who cares? Nobody would right. have even given it a second look. It's the fact that it's weird in that distinctly AI way gives it this very uh, dreamlike uh, experience. I think some of the ways that AI video morphs are probably the closest any video has ever come to emulating what dreams tend to feel like when you're trying to remember them. And it is this mishmash, you know, and it, th there's all kinds of reasons for that. If you've ever studied dream theory, you know, that the fact <clears> that, <throat> that, you know, when we're conscious, we experience things in, in sequence, there's a sense of time, it's, it's chronological. And the theory, the most prevalent theories with dreaming are when we're dreaming, it's not bound by that rule whatsoever. Um, there is no real rules in terms of time in terms of how images are used and, and, you know, people, people or characters in your dreams appear as metaphors. And there's a whole, you know, yeah. from Freud on forward, there's yeah. a whole amazing yeah, yeah, yeah. study of that kind of thing. And I feel like a, that AI, uh, most AI generated video, not the newest stuff from Sora, which looks <laughs> hyper realistic and therefore to me kind of boring. Like, I mean, it's mm. like, okay, cool. Who mm. cares? You know? This, 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 what we'll probably one day refer to as early days of mid journey or early days of runway. Right. Uh, where it's morphing in this very odd way, this, this way that would be hard to, hard to, to, uh, to break it down as like, it's hard to discern any kind of methodology there. It feels very random and flowy and, you know, like one of the dogs will be facing one way and then somehow it morphs and it's facing the other and just, oh, it's just, it's fascinating. So, and so for this film, which I agree with Ricky, it does seem like it's seated in the venue of memory or dream. 
it's perfect. It's a perfect choice for that. And um, it is very abstract, um, but very uh, enjoyable. And I'm, I'm, I agree with you too, Ricky. I'm glad that the length isn't too long. Um, this is like, films like this are like very, uh, if you've ever followed like a, or gone to a really nice restaurant with some high-end chef, a lot of times it's some just amazingly complicated dish uh, in a very tiny portion. And it's because the food is so rich that there really isn't, you know, you can't serve it up like going to Chick-fil-A and having a big mound of food American style. It doesn't make any sense, right? It's too rich for that. Right. Great analogy. And I feel like that these abstract films are a lot like that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's this thing that has been obsessed over and it's got a richness to it that you don't need a whole lot. And it, and it kind of expands on your on your palate, if you will. Yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, I, great. I, I think it's a great decision to, to keep it nice and short and, and it is, it's dense with ideas, but in a very abstract way, like it's not, it's not oppressive at all or about what its idea is supposed to be. I think that's a key to good abstract art. Yeah. Really, yeah. Is that it's not insistent. That's the term I'm looking for. It's not insisting it's not on an idea. It's not pushy. Yeah, it doesn't it's compel didactic. at all. Yeah. Right. So I enjoyed it very, very much. Um, uh, it, 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 it's one that even though I couldn't turn off my analytic, analytical mind, which as a filmmaker tends to want to dissect, how did they do this? How was this made? I couldn't, right. I couldn't, I couldn't manage to turn that off completely and be immersed, but it was... Uh, maybe the nice thing was is that I was able to quickly get past that point. 20 seconds into the film, I understood, okay, here's the elements that are being presented here. And from that point forward, I just enjoyed what was being put on the screen for me. So um, that's yeah, great. I, I, I loved it. And um, yeah, a great pick, Ricky. Really, really enjoyable and very out of the norm for us. I love it. I love your cooking analogy. This is so appropriate. Thank you. Yeah. Tracy uh, oh. or uh, Damien? Well, I was going to say Damien thought? go and then I'll I'll wrap the one if you like. Yeah, because I kind of want to follow on what Phil just said because mm. I'm kind of in the, at the beginning of Phil's bit, you said you were in the camp of finding AI being interesting for being weird. I'm in the opposite. I'm not really a huge fan of AI generated art because a lot of people I know are threatened by it and I feel like I want to support them. So I had to watch this twice because the first time I watched it, that was in my mind. So then I had to switch that off and watch it again and just enjoy it. <clears throat> and what came to Smart. mind was, yeah. So what came to mind was that Batman film we uh, reviewed um, a couple of months back, which had an AI generated script. Mm -hmm. And you know, we weren't too kind on that one because it, you know, the dialogue was terrible because it hadn't, it had come up with this stuff that wasn't that great. And um, anyway, we're not reviewing that film again, but that's what came to my mind. And I, I found myself comparing this film to that one. And this one works a lot better because it's got that experimental side to it that, you know, the Batman film was meant to be a serious Batman story and the AI generated content just didn't work for that. Whereas this, the weirdness that you were talking about, Phil, works for this because it, that's the point. It's meant to be different and experimental. So I found it interesting that um ai could be used in a very creative way for this and, and you know I, I really enjoyed it for that um uh, despite my misgivings about ai generated content um so yeah this is the kind of thing that i think ai content you know generation works well for um because once you get to the point where ai is trying to you know do replicate you know hollywood films or all of that it, it just falls apart because yeah you know it, you need the people to make that real but you know for this yeah it works and i think ricky has a really great pick oh i'm so glad you enjoyed I'm, it i'm really glad you brought up the uh the lyrics or the the wording aspect because i didn't even mention that and yeah that's a key component here as well uh yeah. damien you're right um the and and you're exactly right the i i thought of the batman film as well and it, it did it, it the, the batman film trying to implement um, chat GPT to generate a screenplay basically is what he said he did and doesn't sound like it was altered much 
from what chat GPT spit out to what he, what he tried to produce. Right. 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 And it didn't work. Um, <laughs> this, I feel like the less human tampering, the better, because it is leaning into that weirdness element. It almost comes across, uh, when, when you get AI to generate text in a specific way, it almost comes across with the same vibe as the disorganized speech of a schizophrenic patient, like a severely schizophrenic person, where there are logical connections that we tend to make when using language that they do not abide by. And so there's this jumping around between ideas that, yeah, that just yeah. it defies it's it's like listening to disorganized speech and you can go on youtube and find uh recordings where they've interviewed someone who has severe schizophrenia and trying to make sense of of what they're saying is a lot like when you wake up and you're trying to make make sense of a dream that was really incomprehensible you know and it, it, you struggle because again the dream was composed in a world where those rules don't get abided by. And then now as you wake, you can't help but try to put things into a chronology and and whatnot. And so I think that that the the AI generated speech actually had a similar uh, outcome in in and and in this case, yeah, you're right, Damien. It worked because uh it needed to be weird, you know? Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. You couldn't Putting this visual over a Robert Frost poem or something just wouldn't wouldn't work, <laughs> you know. Robert Frost is a beautiful poet, but I just no, that wouldn't work, you know. Maybe some maybe maybe some writings of James Joyce or or uh, um, the Donna you know, poets or who's who's the uh, who's the sixties beat poet Ricky that uh, his I think his most famous work is Lion. Uh, Cummings? Uh, e, was it E.E. E. Cummings or not E.E. E. Cummings? This mm. this this guy. Um, oh gosh, hold on. Uh, who did Lion? Dad Burn. I'm not going to be able to find it. Someone out there is like shouting at the, <laughs> at the podcast yeah, right now. Of course. <laughs> um, we'll find it later. It, one. But yeah. Anyway. Uh, yeah, but no, the 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 AI, AI generated text is interesting. They used, I think, in the credits, it said that he used uh, he or she used Copilot, which is a Microsoft's Chat GPT answer, right? right. Um, and then something else. There was some other AI tool involved as well, and then of course the AI generated video. So yeah, yeah. To me, that that's an interesting use of these tools. Is and it, it's something that uh, Damien, I've got a lot of artist friends who feel like I, I would guess the same way that yours do about the AI art and what I'm, I guess the case that I'm quietly and slowly trying to make to them is that properly wielded, these are interesting tools for an artist to use. And I think that a lot of the artists who are put off by AI art is because the people who are loudest using the stuff right now are non-artists. Quite. Are people who just, expedient and just well look i could just type a few words and now i do the same thing that you do with hours of effort you know that's that's who makes the headlines with this stuff but where it gets really interesting is when someone like ferdinand fow who is an artist uses these tools as an artist uh it's 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 very interesting you know so then what do you say that ferdinand fow isn't an artist anymore because he used those that that doesn't really work um they're just very strange tools and i think uh we could have a whole episode sometime on, on kind of an updated state of the ai art argument um because it's a fascinating topic but sure is i think i think some of the things that are said about ai art today are the same things that were said when midi was introduced to the music world midi is this electronic way of capturing essentially a musical performance that it, it records the note values over time and how hard the key was pressed. And then you can go and edit it later and make it do anything you want. It's think of it as almost like an auto tune for music type of thing, you know? Uh, uh. And when it was first introduced, 
quote unquote real musicians in were just scoffing at it and using the exact same criticisms that are being used about AI art today. And now MIDI is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. Uh, it's even it, it. First of all, the fidelity with which it can capture a performance, it is used to record a performance. And you, I could, for example, record a performance where I'm playing a piano, an electronic piano, and then change it to be organ or harpsichord or or frogs, you know, with a sampler. So, and no one nowadays makes the case that use of MIDI in in music production makes it not real music or makes mm, it yeah. less artistic. Um, so, but we're in the very early days of this AI art. I think the same thing would would have been said about Photoshop. The types of things you can do in Photoshop compared to the effort of doing that with real photography or painting or any of those other art forms, Photoshop was probably poo-pooed in a similar way. What, you can just click and fill in a gradient automatically between this color and that? You know, that's cheating. That's not real artwork. Do you know how hard it is to make a gradient in real life? So I feel like we're at one of those moments again with, yeah, with yeah. The AI art. And it feels different because this is so advanced and because the effort to output ratio is so vast, right? It's never been where you can just type a few words. Right. right. And have something be done. It feels like you're not doing much work at all. And and frankly, in a lot of cases with AI art, you're not. But to me, that doesn't make it less interesting. Yep. Um, mm. At all. Mm. Um, it's it is what it is. It's not going anywhere. Maybe that's the only argument that needs to be made for some people is look, this thing is here. So you're either going to learn how to reckon with the fact that it exists, or you're just going to become bitter and disillusioned. You know, fighting something that will never go away. This will never, ever go away. Never. It's only going to advance. So anyway. Yeah. I said we could record a whole episode on it. Now I've turned this episode into that. I don't know guys. <laughs> Crazy. Well, uh, we, well, we have got an omnibus coming up where we've got a few AI tools to talk about anyway. So we could discuss that a bit more there as well. All right. I was going to say a little bit about that, but I, I, I kind of won't bother the, the, the second tool that they mentioned um, was Suno, which is about music composition. So you're quite right to discuss the MIDI tool there, I think. Um, well, some of my views are actually very similar to all of the things you guys have been saying. But let me um, share with you some of the diggings out that I um, that I managed to uncover, if you like, as I was uh, going through this one. So um, Val Ferdinand is otherwise known as Yale Gilks. Um, she's actually Israeli and she lives in London. Um, mm. And it's actually also an established Second Life performance artist who's been in world and producing creative stuff since um, the very early days, 2004. Um, oh, wow. So one of the one of the very first, I think. Um, now, what she says is um, her work is uh, she, the way she describes it is, is, is it's a, a metamorphosis of life. Uh, often dealing with the theme of life and death from either one state of existence uh, to the other or, or, or vice versa in what she describes as a surrealist tradition. Um, and she very much works with this idea of dissolving fluidity um, and she's um, focusing on entering this world through a dreamscape, which you've discussed, through which she um, surrounds herself. Um as I understand it, the practice that she has encompasses both digital painting, also makeup artist, interventions, animation, as well as performance art. And what's quite interesting here, here is because of this really long background, she was actually or is actually part of an artist collective called Second Front. I don't know if you remember these guys. Um, mm -hmm. They were a group of artists working in Second Life, which formed in around 2006, and that comprised of Gazira Babeli. Do you remember Bibi Hansen, who's mm -hmm. the daughter of Al Hansen, who worked with um, um, mm -hmm. uh, um, Warhol? Um, Doug Jarvis, Scott Kildall, uh, Patrick Lichty, and Liz Solo. So these are guys that kind of collaborate on 
projects or, or call themselves a collective working as individuals. They created score-based performances and interventions um, that were about challenging notions of traditional performance, um, but also uh, looking at things like virtual embodiment and the culture of immateriality. Um, and I, when as I was looking at, at, at the kind of work they were doing, I kind of felt that it was more of a, what I would call a spiritual successor to the Fluxus movement of the uh. 60s and 70s, which yeah, I think you is what you've really picked up on there, Ricky. Um, mm. But the aim of that was specifically to break down barriers in creating uh, more connected and immersive experiences, focusing on the, the performative aspects of the work, often involving audiences um, and often also allowing for chance, specifically chance, to influence the work, which I think is, is kind of really interesting. This particular film has been made with somebody called L. Uh, Thorkfeld, um, who's also a new media artist working in digital, generative and glitch art, um, virtual reality, sculpture and installations and GIF art as well. And her focus is on experimenting with colour, form, randomness and using chaos as an element of the creative practice. And here, I think what we have is a, is a, a form of work that has a lineage back to that kind of 60s and 70s kind of fluxus sort of type of work. Um, and and I, I think I think I would, I would go along that route because of the clear way in which the tools have been used to generate images, words and music. Um, and I guess the main divergence um, from, say, fluxus isn't here that it's been performed in real time, which a lot of that stuff was, um, because, and I think pre simply because this kind of process for creative practice doesn't work like that just yet. But my guess is that's what they're aiming to do in due course. And I think what you've got here is something that's clearly a celebration of the of the random glitchiness of the of the generate generative AI's be uh, tools being used. So I think that's a deliberate choice. That glitchiness is a is a kind of a deliberate choice, and and the way they've seeded it is designed to allow chaos into the process, um, which I think is really interesting, and and a perfect tool set. I mean, what else would they use but yeah, these yeah. kinds of tools if that's what they're about? I think it's, exactly. a, it's an absolutely mm -hmm. uh, you know a perfect hand in glove type fit. I think the imagery is really interesting, and and, and as you kind of said, it begins. Not, I didn't pick up the dog so much to start with because it's this morphing, fractured cityscape. Um, and I think it's something we're quite um, used to seeing at the moment um, with the images yeah, I... that we're seeing uh, both of Ukraine's towns and also... Palestine. Uh, yes, exactly, of Gaza. And given this artist Israeli, is Israeli, I could imagine there's some kind of deep emotional connection to what, what we're seeing. Yeah, And then you see, I think what you see begins to make a bit, well, uh, if sense is even what what, what is um, attempted for here. But to me, what I think you're seeing then is this kind of lost or distressed woman, unkempt and skimpily clothed with a background of these kind of morphing dogs. Um, and that's all going on as the words begin. Um, but these words make very little sense. I mean, I, I listened to it two or three times. And then I put the, you know, the translator thing on just to see what was being said. And then they're random. They don't make any sense. There's odd bits that you can pull out of them, but there isn't a lot of sense. And that sort of schizophrenic idea kind of, I think maybe, you, maybe you're on something with that. But I guess I got the sense here of maybe this is somebody through a dreamscape looking for a lost dog, perhaps. I don't know. That's what kind of came through in, in, in that sort of sense. And then the other thing that I sort of picked up on is is that she appears to be wandering around. And I thought at first this this grey swirling mist was an analogy to, to the dream, but I think it's an analogy to smoke and um, fire-filled landscape. Um, and, you know, somebody that's kind of, um, you know, really, really is basically trying to find this dog and becomes more and more distressed, although... Um, the words, if you like, such such as they are, seem to suggest in the end that there's always a new dawn, even though what it in the end shows is pictures of of flies and presumably death. 
Um, overall, the film doesn't clearly, I think, have a happy ending, although maybe what it's illustrating is a circle of modern life in a particular type of context. And like you, Phil, I try to make sense of the title. Dog Days, you know, it, it meant that to me as well, but also this kind of idea of period of inactivity. But as, but I also, like you, drew the conclusion that what what it was really was a, was a literal use of this term. Uh, and the Dog Days are, are, are simply because this person is consumed um, with thinking about a dog. <laughs> Maybe that's what's going on. And then I found myself wondering what the images of the woman represent, as the, as the words seem to be out about war and rebirth, or at least in my mind. Um, but what was interesting, I think, was that the, uh, um, the camera, as, as that camera kind of moved closer to this woman, she became more cyborg and somehow more fractured, although she wasn't AI generated in the same way that the rest of the content seemed to be. Um, and, and, and also she wasn't portrayed as dreamlike. Um, I concluded really from that kind of presentation of it that um, maybe what they were trying to do here was reflect on the role of, of generative AI as a, as a tool. Um, and perhaps what you're looking at is that it's incomplete and fractured uh, as it as it kind of is now, and and maybe what you've got there is a commentary on on how we are becoming cyborg with the absorption of these kinds of tools. Because I definitely got the feeling here that there was a lot of deeper messages uh, encapsulated uh, within what what you were seeing. But it was a maybe great deeper pick. and maybe unrelated messages too. Maybe unrelated, absolutely. You know? maybe yeah, that's random. that's that's interesting stuff. Um, but yeah, that was my thoughts and my digging around on it. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, Thank you. Somewhat. <laughs> Not a great yeah, topic. <laughs> I, I understand, of course. To, well, to thank riff you. a little bit real quick on, on Tracy, on what you said, because uh, I mentioned earlier that the film didn't insist on a specific message or idea and that I appreciate that. That being said, I did come away with a pretty specific uh interpretation of it which i think is mine i i take ownership of that and I, I i maintain that the film didn't insist on this but you know this the war-torn uh urban landscape which yeah it has a very uh it evokes some pretty specific things we've been seeing like you said tracy yeah. mm -hmm. i did not know that Fal Ferdinand was uh, was from a region where that's happening, uh, but that makes a lot of sense because the sense that I got from it was that that war torn landscape is where life is right now, and there's a sense of longing for <laughs> the days when I mean, when do you really? There are grown adults who get very attached to pets. Yes, Damien absolutely. has at least one cat that regularly visits upon him and, and uh, you know, takes advantage of him for food and such as, as uh, we have one in our neighborhood as well. Yes. Uh, but I mean, when, but, and, 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 you know, and there are times when, you know, Ricky, you guys had cats at the Iliad and always have right and and so yep. there is an adult attachment that happens with with a pet like a dog for example but when is it more more precious than when you're a child because then you don't have any of the responsibilities mm. or worries that you do as an adult you've just got nothing but time to give to this animal that in the case of a dog wants nothing but to spend time with you too you know yeah and yeah. life was so simple and precious and beautiful and as you grow up you lose you know you still have memories of that but they become more and more diluted and they merge together and yeah. i mean you can see where i'm going with this right yeah, so it, yeah. it's i really got a sense of that one way this film could be interpreted is the bombed landscape is what I'm seeing as an adult, this is the world I'm in now, you know, either it's because the world has become that or because I'm seeing the world for what it has been and is, and mm -hmm. it's not pretty like it was when I was a kid, 
you know, because yeah. I know so much more now about how awful people treat each other. And because of the internet, we all know that on a global scale, you know, every time someone shoots up a supermarket, we all know in 10 minutes on Twitter, what kind of a world, you know? So, so there's, there's no mm. more, if you're at all awake, there's no more maintaining a sugar coated view of the world. Mm. And there's a part of you, even though you don't want to regress, but there is a part of everyone, I think, that sometimes wishes for, man, wasn't it nice when I was so much younger and none and of this made any maybe, difference? And I didn't know any of this yet. Yeah. You know, I, I just, life was beautiful. It was yeah. just me and my dog. We just played. Yeah. And those, those memories are further and further away. And so more and more muddled. Mm. I hope no one thinks I'm pushing that interpretation on them. No, that's, no I think that, it's a no, no, no. reasonable interpretation. And yet, mm. and yet somehow I still maintain the film didn't insist on that. Yeah. But it, it allowed me to have that experience with it. Um, and uh, it's it's amazing that 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 came through, even though none of those things were said in the film explicitly. Uh, you, you can't make much sense of anything that was said in the film. Um, but the combination of the imagery and the sound and then these weird words and the, the whole feel and then what I brought to it. Yeah. You know? I mean, let's face it, my review of the film just now, what the film was saying was more about me than it was about the film, right? Well, that's abstract, the point I want to... Abstract art is the best at that. Yeah, that's the point I wanted to make to close out our discussion is that <clears throat> abstract art and experimental art is often acting like a mirror to the person who's watching it. And you actively participated in by providing imaginative connections to images and things like that. Whereas realistic art, your standard generative art, the viewers pass it and they allow the storytellers to tell their story and you passively accept all of the interpretations and things like that. It's more it's escapism, isn't it? Yeah. A lot a, of times, a lot of times way, it's escapism and this is the opposite. <laughs> exactly. And I think that's what the appeal to certain people is that ability to be able to invest a, a, a work of art with your own connections, your own imaginations. Cause we all want to take things that don't seem to make sense and then make connections between them. Mm. Make it makes sense in your mind. And I think that's one of the things that attracts artists like Val Ferdinand, because they know that process is occurring and it might even be occurring for them. While, while making, making it. it. Yes. While yes, making, absolutely. You know what I mean? Mm. So, and I think that's a unique, the last thing I want to say is that I think that's a unique quality of performance art, because in the past, women were often drawn to performance art because it was a, a method of female empowerment. They could be on stage, they could be in an art gallery and say, I am a woman and this is my experience in a way that they couldn't in social situations. <clears throat> now, the actual physicality of their bodies has been turned into a virtual object in Second Life or in other formats. So then they can morph that image into every conceivable form, look, way, style, anything that they want in order to create an expression of who they are. So it's a perfect combination of personal expression and public uh, display in a way that creates a, a kind of friction or compliment. And I think that attracts people like her and, and other female performance artists because they love to be able to talk about the issues that are important to them as women in this world. Uh, a woman's perspective on war is going to be very different from a man's perspective on war. And I think in a way, those things are fantastic. And I'm glad we have people like Val Ferdinand making art uh, while we have millions and millions of others doing stuff that is often inconsequential. 
So congratulations to you, Frau Ferdinand, and for your excellent work. I urge you to visit her channel on Vimeo because she has many other films uh, that are... I just chose this one because it appealed to me the most. But there are many other things in there that I really like. Well, as always, if you have comments or you disagree or you think Phil's just up a tree with the AI approach, uh, send us... <laughs> Your thoughts at talk at completelymachinima.com. I'm Ricky. Thanks to Tracy and Phil and Damon for your comments. Comments, And we'll have links to the film and links to Fal Ferdinand in our uh, show notes. So that's it for the show today. Thanks for watching. We'll see you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.